I know many of you aren't going to agree with some of my opinions and commentary and historical analysis, but I suppose that's what this channel is all about. Hello everyone and welcome to the latest episode of Real History. I am your host, history professor Jared Frederick, and for this episode we are going to be taking a look at a very well-known Civil War film that is loved by some and reviled by many more, and that is the 2003 film Gods and Generals. And we thought there's no better way to commemorate the 20th anniversary of this film than dissecting it a little bit, separating fact from fiction, and uh, looking at some of its complexities and also some of its problems along the way. And so what we are going to be doing is that we are going to be analyzing this film in three parts because it is a very long movie after all. We're going to be taking a look at the film's content set in the years 1861, 1862, and 1863. And that way it'll be a little bit more digestible for all of you viewers at home. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right in and take a look at Gods and Generals. You'll notice with the opening titles that this is a Ted Turner Pictures film. A Ted Turner budgeted almost all of the money, something like $60 million, to bankroll this film. And it was his intention to make within this film, or with this film, a Civil War trilogy that would include Gettysburg, Gods and Generals, and Last Full Measure. And as our previous interview with Gods and Generals author Jeff Shera indicated, Turner only wanted to break even on this film, and as long as that would happen, the last full measure would be made. But audiences and critics had other plans in mind. More on that to come. Many people have commented that the opening sequence here with the flags and the song Going Home is uh, probably, possibly, the best part of the film. And I think perhaps one of its artistic legacies is that the HBO miniseries John Adams just a few years later definitely ripped off this concept. And a good one it is. So what we see here in these opening scenes is a Blair House off of Lafayette Circle in the shadow of the United States Capitol building. We see Colonel Robert E. Lee of the United States Army arriving at the home of Francis Preston Blair, who was a political power broker within the Republican Party. And it was here on April 17, 1861, that a Blair offered Robert E. Lee command of the United States Army, or at least a portion of it that would be located here in uh, the D.C., Northern Maryland vicinity. Welcome, Colonel Lee. Welcome to my home. Make yourself comfortable there, Colonel. Blair House today still stands, and it is often where uh, foreign dignitaries and visiting heads of state stay while they are uh, visiting the White House or visiting the nation's capital. It's called by some to be the, the world's most exclusive hotel. You have to be of a, a certain designation in order to uh, get a room there. But Blair himself was uh, one who was opposed to slavery. He was um, very much a moderate in some ways. Uh, so much so that he uh, reverted back to the Democratic Party in the years after uh, the Civil War because he had grown uh, fatigued by the so-called radical Republicans who were advocating for uh, civil rights and racial equality. And so perhaps for that reason, Lincoln thought that Blair was the perfect sort of uh, middle-of-the-road sort of individual to extend this olive branch to Robert E. Lee who was on the fence about his loyalty. My country, Mr. Blair, 
I never thought I'd live to see the day that a president of the United States would raise an army to invade his own country. These sentiments being expressed by Lee in the film are true to the historical record. And in the book by Doris Kearns Goodwood, Team of Rivals, uh, Lee is quoted as saying this, Mr. Blair, I look upon secession as anarchy. If I owned the four millions of slaves in the South, I would sacrifice them all to the Union. But how can I draw my sword upon Virginia, my native state? And so in this regard, Lee is most definitely drawing a line of identity, of one of cultural and political and ancestral identity in so many regards. These sentiments, though, aren't to disassociate Lee's connection with slavery. Lee came from a slave-owning family. He had inherited a number of slaves on Arlington Estate from his late father-in-law. And in fact, when a number of his slaves decided they were going to run away in the year 1859, this is what one of them, an enslaved man by the name of Wesley Morris, had to say about the issue. We were immediately taken before General Lee, who demanded the reason why we ran away. We frankly told him that we considered ourselves free. He then told us he would teach us a lesson we would never forget. And each of those individuals received 50 lashes and then had brine poured on their open wounds. So Lee's fealty to Virginia, once again, it is not to disassociate him with the institution of slavery in which he had a very strong economic interest. If you are placing your energies elsewhere, you will not succeed either with me or in your careers as military officers. So now we are introduced to another United States Army officer, Thomas Jonathan Jackson, seen here teaching artillery tactics at the Virginia Military Institute. And I cannot imagine that Jackson would have been a very inspiring professor. His students thought him somewhat dull, draconian. He was not very inventive in the classroom, in stark contrast to some of the daring that he would display on the battlefield in months and years to come. We now see the grounds of what was then known as Washington College, now known as Washington and Lee University. One of the strengths of this film is that it was filmed in many of the actual locations. It certainly has the right ambience. Uh, and that serves very well for this discussion that we see right now with the characters of Jackson and his father-in-law, a Reverend George Junkin. Jackson's first wife, Eleanor, had passed away in childbirth in 1854. And despite that, Jackson stayed in touch with his father-in-law, his former father-in-law, Reverend George Junkin. I, I will not stay in a place where my students dishonor their country's flag. Who was very much a unionist. And the coming of the Civil War ultimately brought about the disillusion of their friendship. And that was something that uh, really uh, struck at the heart of Jackson. The delegates of this convention, harried by the rash actions of a belligerent usurper and the radicals of his party, have stumbled into secession. There's a number of interesting things to point out here in these scenes, which is supposed to be the Virginia State House in Richmond, Virginia. Um, in actuality, uh, this is the county courthouse that is located in Charlestown, West Virginia. And this is actually the very courtroom in which abolitionist John Brown was tried and sentenced to death in the year 1859 for his uprising at Harper's Ferry. So this setting itself is very historical, although in a different context from what we see here. This convention now calls upon Robert Edward Lee to take command of the armed forces of the Citizen Army of Virginia. The actor here, Robert Easton, with the long white hair, is uh, playing the real life figure who was the chair of the Virginia Secession Convention. And his name was John Janey. 
And uh, Janey, too, uh, was uh, somewhat of a centrist. He was a Quaker, yet at the same time he was also a slave owner. And upon secession in 1861, he declared, Gentlemen, the responsibility resting upon this body is an awful one. When I agreed to be candidate for this convention, I said it with fear and trembling. And so he most definitely had this apprehension and this sense of things to come. I devote myself to the service of my native state. I spoke to uh, an actor who was on set here for this scene. And uh, he actually indicated that actor Robert Duvall became really perturbed during this scene because he was having trouble remembering his lines and he became quite agitated as a result. Uh, and so what they eventually did is they cheated a little bit. They put Robert E. Lee's speech on the podium where it would be out of camera angle view and Duvall could refresh on his lines as needed as they were filming. Actor Martin Sheen, who had played Robert E. Lee in Gettysburg, had shown interest in reprising his role. But at the time that this movie was set to be filmed, Martin Sheen was still dedicated to the NBC drama The West Wing, in which he played the president. So that's why uh, he was not able to return to the role. When you go to Richmond, and wherever this war takes you, you must not fear for us. So here we are introduced to the real life character of Jane Beale, uh, who presents some of the civilian perspective in this film. Uh, Jane Beale sent four sons to fight in the Confederate Army, and they ultimately joined the ranks of the 1st Virginia Infantry and also the Fredericksburg Artillery. I think one of the reasons that director-screenwriter Ron Maxwell opted to incorporate her into the film is because she left a very vivid account of her Civil War exploits in the form of a diary that were subsequently published. Certainly this seemed a good primary source to incorporate when considering how civilians had to cope with the tumult that was about to happen in Fredericksburg in the years to come. I know there are a thousand brothers leaving a thousand homes. I know we're not the only ones, Mother. The street view that we have here is actually looking into the historic district of downtown Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. Uh, but if you wish to see the real Bill home, uh, you can go to 305 Lewis Street in Fredericksburg, Virginia, where the home still stands. And as a quick follow-up to that, we're introduced to another real-life historical structure, and that is Thomas Jackson's house located in downtown Lexington, Virginia, which likewise still stands today. And it is a museum that one can go tour. Immediately with the Corps of Cadets to Camp Instruction to begin formal training and organization of the Provisional Army for the defense of the Commonwealth of Virginia. I can't help but laugh a little bit because uh, Mrs. Jackson here, you may remember, she's the, the flight attendant of Meet the Parents. Before I leave, we must sit, read together. Yes, here. Corinthians, second Corinthians chapter five. Jackson was of course a fierce Presbyterian. Uh, he was highly involved in the religious community that was located within Lexington, Virginia. Uh, but I think one of the shortcomings of the film and one of the things that adds on to its seemingly interminable length at times uh, is the fact that it seems like in every other scene Jackson is pulling out the Bible uh, and he's sermonizing and he's making allegories between the Testaments and his situations, which very well may have happened in real life, but for the purposes of condensing these things into a movie, it's just not digestible. Here we see the real Virginia Military Institute as the backdrop for these scenes and they had to uh, very cleverly camouflage the statue of Stonewall Jackson that existed there at the time, although it has since been removed. Future filmmakers won't have that problem. I once spoke to a reenactor who uh, portrayed one of the VMI cadets in that scene, uh, and he said that 
Uh, they had to film both Jackson departing for war as well as Jackson's funeral procession in the same day. And so it was uh, two very uh, contrasting emotions that the extras had to convey between those two different setups. Some of these scenes that we see here are a bit nostalgic for me, not because of necessarily what they show, but because of the setting in which they take place. These shots were filmed at Harpers Ferry National Historical Park. And as a young teenager, I started volunteering and working in this same setting just a, a few summers after this movie came out. And so uh, these streets and backyards and dwellings are uh, places that are very familiar to me and near and dear to my heart. And of course, Harper's Ferry is a, is a perfect setting, a uh, perfect location for the, the filming of this movie. Uh, you had a set that was worth uh, tens of millions of dollars that would have had to have been created otherwise. Slavery will eventually die of natural causes but the breakup of the Union will inaugurate wars of a hundred generations in America. So in the script for Gods and Generals, this character speaking to Jackson at this moment is described as Reverend David S. Jenkins. And I tried looking him up and I didn't have too much success in finding out much about this guy. And I presume that he's a fictional composite character. It's curious as to why this fictional character is introduced here because uh, time and again, uh, Virginians are being incorporated into the script saying that this war isn't about slavery, it's gonna die of natural causes. Slavery was not going to die of natural causes. It was growing by the 1850s and the 1860s. Uh, short of slavery expanding into the 20th century, uh, slavery was not going to die except by civil war, period. I am a soldier in the 4th Virginia, and in the 4th Virginia I will stay, and if needs be, die. The Commonwealth of Virginia was not as ardent or wordy in its articles of secession as some of its other neighbors deeper in the South. Uh, however, the state believed that the coming of the war was brought on by a perversion of powers and a coercion brought about by the federal government. And they said in their articles of secession that the federal government has led not only to, quote, the injury of the people of Virginia, but to the oppression of the southern slaveholding states. There it is in black and white. Men of the valley. Citizen soldiers, I'm here at the order of General Robert E. Lee, commanding all Virginia forces. So here we are introduced to the famous outfit that will later become known as the Stonewall Brigade. The Stonewall Brigade was composed of the 2nd, 4th, 5th, 27th, 33rd Virginia Infantry Regiments, as well as the Rock Bridge Artillery. This was an outfit that was destined for fame and very colorful exploits throughout the war. And as is later said in the film, uh, Jackson insisted that the nickname of the Stonewall Brigade, it belonged not to him, but the men who comprised the outfit itself. Perhaps this day might not have come, but that day has been thrust upon us like it was thrust upon our ancestors. As we look here at the ranks of the common soldiers who are uh, looking up to their commander, it's important to absorb the aspects and the motivations of some of these common soldiers. And we can get two distinctive views in this regard. We can take at first the words of Private Andrew J. White, who was a member of the 30th Georgia Infantry. He noted, if I fall, it will be in a good cause in the defense of my country, defending my home and fireside. But there were others who saw ancestry and the significance of land 
more than something about just as abstract as heritage. We have the words of Captain Elias Davis of the 8th Alabama Infantry, who said, I vow to fight forever rather than submit to freeing Negroes amongst us. We are fighting for rights and property bequeathed to us by our ancestors. And thus, the importance of ancestry, it had to do more than about the revolutionary fervor of George Washington and the principles of liberty of Patrick Henry. It also included the owning of human property. Even if the director doesn't fully know how to handle a script, he does know how to handle the landscape. There is some great scenery within this film that really captures the essence of what I think uh, Virginia during the Civil War years looked like. Uh, the, the location scouters did a, a fantastic job eyeing this all out. Uh, and as Ron Maxwell himself said, the land is a character in this film, and I think that is a, a very true testament. And the general hopes that his soldiers will step out and keep closed ranks. Well, this march is a forced march to save our country. Sandy Pendleton would become one of Jackson's most trusted staff members uh, throughout the war. He had uh, initially served in his father's artillery outfit and uh, Jackson had an eye for talent and quickly recruited him and Pendleton seen as an opportunity to possibly move through the ranks quickly accepted that offer but Pendleton much like Jackson would be killed in the war as well just like I always dreamed it'd be do you suppose a Virginia legislature was gonna buy you your own personal tent that's fine for now You'll be humming a different tune when it's raining. Another one of the inherent problems of this film, as my dad might say, it tries to put 10 pounds of manure into a five pound bucket. There's just too much here. Is this a movie purely about Jackson? Is it a focus in the command structure of the Army of Northern Virginia? Is it a story about the common rank and file? Is it a story of civilians? Is it, is it a story of the enslaved people owned by those civilians? There's too many storylines. It can't decide where it wants to go. Ron Maxwell would have been far better off had he stayed truer to the novel by Jeff Shera, which is focused and is balanced. This movie is neither of those things. That's it. Step lively. Two at a time. As quick as you can. These scenes at the Piedmont Railhead, I think, are revealing for a few reasons, because never in warfare had something like this been incorporated into a master plan. The idea of uh, moving troops and supplies in such an efficient and dramatic fashion. We're also likewise uh, reintroduced to the character of Isaac Trimble, uh, who, as he mentioned, uh, was an engineer on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad and uh, gains fame later on uh, at Gettysburg, uh, played by the, the same actor in this case. Colonel Josh, Colonel Trimble, I understand you're a train man. But in any regard, Jackson was already familiar with this railroad system, particularly the Manassas Gap Railroad, uh, because uh, in the earlier phase of the war, uh, he and his men dismantled locomotives in Martinsburg, Virginia, now West Virginia, and had them pulled by horse through portions of the valley, something like 40 miles uh, and then had them dispatched to Richmond to be reassembled. It was this incredible logistical feat. Uh, and then we get to this point where some 10,000 troops belonging to the Confederate Corps of Joseph E. Johnston are put onto these trains in what is now known as Delaplane, Virginia. Uh, back then it was known as Piedmont Station. Uh, and this was the first time 
that troops had been taken into a combat zone by rail. And it was absolutely revolutionary. Uh, and this is one of many reasons why the Civil War is known as the first modern war. So here we are on Henry House Hill, July 21st, 1861. The first major land battle of the Civil War at First Manassas or First Bull Run, whatever your preference may be. And some historians have likened this fight as two armed mobs lunging into each other. Armies whose uh, color coding of uniforms had not been solidified yet. It, it led to confusion. Uh, everybody was green, everybody was untrained, and they knew it uh, heading into the battle. Um, but this sort of environment allowed individuals to test their mettle, to see what their true capacities as leaders were. And in this regard, the likes of Thomas, soon to be Stonewall Jackson, most definitely moved forward. <laughs> You might consider it odd that these uh, Confederate cannon, so named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are painted red, uh, but such as were the real guns uh, at that time. And you can see the configuration of those exact guns on display today, I believe still, in front of the Virginia Military Institute. Look, there is Jackson standing like a stone wall. Let us determine to die here today and we will conquer. And here are the famous words uttered by General Bernard B. Uh, rallying his troops during this uh, seesaw process uh, between Matthews Hill and Henry House Hill. Uh, and some historians, you know, they look at it in uh, more cynical terms. You know, perhaps he was not being complimentary of Jackson, perhaps he's saying, oh, look at this guy, he's not moving, he's just standing up there like a stone wall. Some cynical historians have made that argument, but it's not very inspiring words. He was probably doing the more inspirational thing to encourage his men to look up to stoical heroism. But to each their own, you decide. Wait till they get close before you shoot. And I must give credit where credit is due. Uh, because the film does quite well in regard to material culture, especially in contrast to some more recent Civil War films. Uniforms go through phases throughout the war. They change, they are altered to circumstances and taste, and you really get a sense of that in this film. Come on, boys! Quick and we can whip them! Easy, man! We have no order to advance! I do like some of these little intricacies within the battle scenes because we truly get a sense that these men are undisciplined, they move by their own whims rather than by orders. Uh, it, it just goes to demonstrate the unpreparedness uh, in which many men entered the arena of battle for the first time. General, sir, the day is going against us. If you think so, sir, you had better not say anything about it. And you'll notice that uh, Jackson has his, his hand raised here, uh, and that's a, a tip of the hat to some of Jackson's quirks and eccentricities. Uh, he purportedly would walk around Lexington with one of his arms raised, and uh, all of that was done to balance out the blood within his body. Uh, he's also an individual who uh, didn't do things that he liked to do. Uh, if he liked bread with butter, he would eat bread without butter. If he liked to put salt and pepper on his food, he wouldn't put salt and pepper on his food. Uh, and so all of this kind of goes back to this sort of spiritual or physical equilibrium that Jackson sought in his life. And uh, Stephen Lang, I think, really does a pretty good job all in all in capturing the essence of some of that uh, both extremism and eccentricity. I do like these little more intimate shots showing the debris of battle, hinting at the, the personal costs associated with many of these fights. These artifacts tell stories. What's the left behind on battlefields tells stories. And uh, as, as fate would have it, just on the day that I'm in filming this, 
uh, just today in Gettysburg National Military Park, uh, and a Civil War artillery shell was discovered. Uh, and so uh, these things are still out there. They are still, in many cases, buried beneath the dirt, and many of them have stories to tell. Jeb Smith, my religious belief teaches me to feel as safe in battle as in death. God has fixed the time for my death. I do not concern myself with that. I think these sort of conversations would have been a far more efficient manner of getting into some of Jackson's uh, religious beliefs, making them more conversational. Uh, his one staffer coming up to him, how are you impervious to all of this? And Jackson says, I believe that I'm as safe in battle as in bed. I, it, it, it speaks to his outlook without being overly preachy about it. I think had the script been tighter, it could have conveyed all of these outlooks of Jackson without being so extraneous at times. The universe itself, superabounding life lavished on this world of ours, is proof. And so here we are an hour into the film and we're finally introduced to the actor who has top billing on all the posters and DVD covers, and that's Jeff Daniels as Chamberlain. Can you imagine if we had gone through the movie Gettysburg and it took us an hour to be introduced to Chamberlain? Uh, once again, this just speaks to the movie's sense of imbalance. It lacks everything that its source material and its predecessor of Gettysburg has. Uh, and that's one of its dramatic failures uh, in this regard. Chamberlain is such a fascinating character, uh, and it's, it's a shame that we go so long in the film without getting his take on all of these issues. Lawrence, I know. Oh. I've noticed the way you've been looking into the children's room each night. Chamberlain had indeed tried to keep his signing up into the United States Army a secret from his wife, Fanny. Uh, he had been offered a, a sabbatical in Europe. Uh, his uh, superiors at Bowdoin College wanted to keep him. They didn't want to see him go away to fight in the United States Army. They said, we'll pay for you to go to Europe. Don't worry about a thing. Go learn all of the classical arts and languages and theories, and your job will still be here when you get back. And instead, what Chamberlain does is that he goes to the governor of Maine. He asks for a commission. He gets it, and his wife was not at all happy as a consequence. And so here's a guy who had a ticket to Easy Street, and he ripped it up right in front of his wife. And talk about grave consequences for both him personally and men in his outfit as a result. Here's another great little bit of inclusion of real life locations. Uh, the home that we see here was the home of Colonel Lewis T. Moore, who is actually an ancestor of Mary Tyler Moore. Uh, this home still stands in Winchester, Virginia, and it is known as the Stonewall Jackson Headquarters Museum, uh, which is a really cool place. There's a lot of really fantastic artifacts uh, that are there. And despite the fact that it's kind of now surrounded by a suburban neighborhood, uh, you can really get a sense of the, the life, the places, and the styles that these people lived in when you go to visit sites like this. You must be Mr. Lewis. There's some that calls me Uncle Tim. This interaction that we see with the enslaved man by the name of Jim Lewis is often considered one of the most problematic of those within the film. To understand some of the controversy behind this, we first need to get a sense of Jackson's relationship with slavery itself. And a really good book to do so is called Rebel Yell by S.C. Gwynn. Um, there's been many, many books written about Jackson, including James I. Bud Robertson's uh, biography, which is often considered one of the hallmark texts on the individual. Uh, but as far as narrative goes, this one is definitely the best. And what Gwynn has to say on this subject matter 
He says, part, this is uh, in regard to Jackson on the eve of the Civil War. He says, part of Jackson's new prosperity and social status was the human property he owned, six slaves, three of whom he had personally acquired, and three who were given to him as a wedding present by Anna's father. Though he had grown up in northwestern Virginia, a place with relatively few slaves that ultimately refused to secede from the Union with the rest of the state, Jackson had been around slaves all his life. Gwynn goes on to say, Though we have no record of how he regarded his slaves, Anna, his wife, had a fairly traditional Southern view. In her memoirs, she referred to their slaves as among, quote, other animate possessions of the family, lumping them together with the family's horse, milk, cows, and chickens. If you love your country, fear the Lord, and have no trouble getting up at four o'clock in the morning, the job is yours. Now, Jackson had established a Sunday school for African American children, but one must ask, what were these children being preached? In all possibility, they were being preached pro-slavery Christianity, which was a common practice on plantations, both large and small, throughout the South. This point is up to speculation. One of the biggest problems in regard to how Jim is depicted in the film is that in reality, there's just not a lot of historical information on him. He's written almost with a passing observation and a lot of memoirs written by Confederate officers who interacted with Jackson. Gwynn tries to clarify Jim's relationship a little bit further, and this is what he says. Jim was always with him and devoted to him, tending to matters involving food, clothing, bedding, or lodgment, baggage, the care and maintenance of Little Sorrel, Jackson's horse, or whatever else was needed. It is not clear where Jackson found him, though it is likely Jim was a slave whom Jackson hired from his owner, one William C. Lewis of Lexington. He rode his own horse. He was an attractive, light-skinned, middle-aged black man with refined manners. Though he professed admiration for Jackson's temperance, he himself liked both liquor and playing cards. And so, with that, we get a little bit more insight into this dynamic, a really interesting dynamic that existed between Jackson and Lewis. But as the, the film is showing it, showing it almost like a, a, a job interview on equal terms, that is probably not how it happened. But wait, there will be more. We haven't even scratched the surface in regard to the problematic depictions of slavery in this film. Stay tuned for forthcoming episodes. And so there you have it, part one of three for our analysis of the film Gods and Generals. Before you head out, we have some recommended reading as always. Like I mentioned, I highly encourage the book by S.C. Gwynn entitled Rebel Yell, which is one of the most thorough examinations of the life of Stonewall Jackson. We also have the book 1861, The Civil War Awakening, one of my favorite books on the Civil War by Adam Goodhart. If you want to get into the, the mindset of people as the American Civil War was starting, you can't do any better than this one. Another book that was very helpful for considering this film uh, is a very nice coffee table book that came out coinciding with the movie. And uh, it has all sorts of uh, fun figures and inside anecdotes uh, about the film and interviews and all sorts of things along those lines, uh, which was very, very helpful for taking a look at the film. And then, of course, last but not least, uh, before you watch the film Gods and Generals, if you haven't seen it already, what you have to do first is read its source material, which sadly it was not true to. Uh, Jeff Scherer's book, which is a prequel to his father's book, The Killer Angels, examines the lives of Lee Jackson, Joshua Chamberlain, and also 
Winfield Scott Hancock, uh, who barely gets a cameo role in this film. Uh, and so this book, oh, it would have been, the movie would have been so much better <laughs> if, if they had stuck with this. Uh, and I know many, many people feel that way. Uh, so in any case, you should read it or revisit it. Gods and Generals by Jeff Shara. That wraps up this episode of Real History. Thank you for joining us for the first of three installments as we examine the 2003 film Gods and Generals. I know many of you aren't going to agree with some of my opinions and commentary and historical analysis, but I suppose that's what this channel is all about. We welcome you to offer your feedback. Keep it respectful, though, in the comments section below. And if you haven't done so already, please make sure that you hit that subscribe button. You can also follow us on our other platforms. You can visit our website at realhistoryfilms.com, and you can also visit our Teespring store to check out all sorts of fine real history merchandise and swag. All of these venues allow us to support ourselves and run this channel accordingly. Thanks so much for tuning in, and until we see you next time on Real History, stay curious.